Hello friends, my name is Yi Da Wang. I'm from AWS. Today, together with some of my colleagues, we are going to update you the latest progress of, of our work using TVM at AWS. In the first 10 minutes, I will share with you some of our ongoing work as well as our thoughts and plans in the near future. After that, my colleagues will introduce to you our recent efforts on dynamic model support via TVM and framework integration of TVM. Okay, first, let me start with some interesting questions that we are thinking about at AWS. The first one is about the feasibility of model inference. And the second question is about uh, extending from model inference to model training. Um, the third one is also about training but uh, here I, uh, I want to talk about human training. Okay, so I will unwrap these three questions one by one. First, about easy model inference. Here is a typical scenario that we usually encounter. We may have a customer approaching us, no matter internal or external. So the customer comes to us um, with a specific pre-trained model in a specific platform. Um, and the request is to you know, obviously execute the model inference efficiently. Okay, I'm pulling this request, what would we do? We have a mixture of good news and bad news at hand. Firstly, this is a typical use case that TVM can handle, right? So it's great. However, the life is not that perfect. The model normally would contain a few unfamiliar or unseen operators that may not run well or even cannot run on a given platform. Then what? Well, good news is that we can tune these operators for better performance. We have auto TVM and recently we also have answer and we may have other more advanced tuning mechanisms in the future, right? That's good. However, tuning is often time consuming, especially on edge devices that um, has very low compute power. So if only one or two cases like this, we can make it work manually. We work very hard on that. However, you know, we are receiving more and more requests at AWS today. So can we make our life easier? Here is our proposed solution. Basically, we, we believe in data. Let me explain. So we would like to have a gigantic database to store the schedules of the operators, or in some cases, subgraphs of all models that we have ever seen on all platforms that we have ever tuned. With such a database, now when we get a new request, namely, let's say, ex executing a model on a platform, we can pass the model and make the queries to the database. If getting a hit, we then have the the optimal performance of the, of the corresponding part, which is great. Otherwise, when getting a miss, we do two things. First, as an immediate solution, we use a cost model to generate a responsible schedule for the compute. There, uh, there are a lot of cost models uh, in the field nowadays, right? So we can leverage any of them. The more important thing here is, so remember that we have a large amount of data with them, our cost model can perform quite well. Yep. Um, so, you know, um, 10 years ago, some of my lab mates at Princeton, they worked on supporting infra uh, ImageNet infrastructure. So we were at that time close to the ImageNet team you know, so I have heard enough story from them about the big data magic, which is like the big data would lead to amazing results on the same algorithm while small data could not. So, you know, the same thing happens here in our preliminary experiments. We have, have observed uh, this. So, you know, with our collected large amount of data, our cost model without any fancy algorithms could produce schedules with near optimal performance. Later today, my colleague Cody will talk about the 
construction of the database and the cost model in more detail. So we call this ongoing project Lorian. Okay, let me continue. Um, so in addition to the immediate result, uh, immediate solution of the, cost, of the cost model, on the other hand, in the background, we will kick off a tuner to tune the compute on the given hardware. Again, the, tuner, the tuning techniques is orthogonal here. We can use any tuner. The tuned result um, will be stored back into the database. More advanced, we can also consider auto-scaling auto and auto-quantization and point receiving a request, especially for model running, for model running uh, on edge devices, uh, which prefer later, uh, lighter computations. Next, and let me switch the focus from inference to training. We have been talking about model inference in TVM community for three years. How about compiler-based model training? We know that uh, XLA is such a solution, especially you know, a solution to TPU. And I think people in the TVM community must have also been talking, uh, thinking about this for quite a while, right? I don't think the extension is trivial and I'm sure you would agree. Here, I would like to share with you um, some known unknowns that we summarized. First, in training, all of a sudden, we have many more operators to worry about. So how to write them or say how to generate, auto-generate them is a question to answer. Second, given so many new operators, and let's say, you know, in this case, twice as big as the graph or computation graph, um, there must be more room for optimization, both in a graph level, like you know, operator fusion, and in a tensor level, like performance tuning. Lastly, large model training requires a number of techniques we barely didn't visit in TVM yet, including distributed training, that is how to partition a model and the, the, the data, and also the data to parallelize across a number of devices, and also memory optimization, something like the trade-off between storage, um, uh, communication bandwidth, and computation power, right? So we need to consider this because the model may be too large to fit into the host memory of a device. And another interesting aspect is to consider the, the sparsity, you know, here, you know, in this case, the sparsity is used to manipulate and regularize the training of gigantic models like G GTP, uh, GPT-3. So these things are not new. People have been thinking about it from one aspect or another. We are working on this, on bringing them to the TVM domain. The work is still pre preliminary and we are looking for collaborations. Um, so, uh, you know, we are also looking for talents to join the team. In AWS, we, as you can imagine, we have a large infrastructure and many use cases to support us to explore along this line. So if you are interested, draw me a line, thanks. Lastly, I want to talk a bit about human training. Um, here, I mean, uh, training beginners to learn about how to use and develop in TVM. I have talked about the same thing last year, and I think it is worthwhile to bring it back again. We have been frustrated by the difficulty of getting people on board for years. So we would like to provide a systematic pro tutorial to make the, training, the learning curve less steep. In our team, we have a successful story before. This D2L book written by my colleagues, they, um, uh, they, it received um, positive feedback from readers and have been adopted by many universities. So a straightforward idea is to extend this work um, from dive into deep learning to dive into deep learning compiler. So, and we are doing so using TVM as a compiler. We brought the entire pipeline and infrastructure from D2L to here we aim at putting together a systematic tutorial for beginners who want to use TVM. We started this effort last year, and uh, but still in halfway. So the major part of the operators are done. I mean, you know, operators like uh, MetaMile, Convolution, Pooling, um, they are defined and optimized on both CPUs and GPUs in this tutorial. However, we are now short of hands of 
extending it to the graph level compilation, you know, the relay stuff actually. So things like uh, how to use the relay to represent a neural network, how to run relay passes like constant folding of op operator fusion, data layout transformation, so on and so forth. And in addition, uh, you know, there may be some interesting recent work to be added into this tutorial. So here again, I am sincerely calling for contributors to this work, which is, you know, this is all open and free. So hopefully together with you, we can lower the bar for newcomers to learn to use and eventually to contribute to the deep learning compiler field. Okay, with that, I would like to um, hand over to my colleague Yao, who's going to talk about some recent work from AWS um, about handling dynamic model uh, using TVM. Thank you. Hi, I'm Yao from Amazon Web Service. Uh, today, I will talk about the work we've done at AWS to support dynamic model in TVM. Static models only has fixed shape operators and doesn't have any dynamic structures. So they are pretty well supported in today's TVM by relay and graph runtime. However, when we talk about object detection models from TensorFlow and PyTorch, uh, they both have dynamic structures such as control flow, tensor array and dynamic shape operators. They require different handlings in three major parts. The first is the front-end parser needs to handle these dynamic structures. The second is we need to implement dynamic operator in Relay and Topi. The third one is we need a runtime system uh, for dynamic shape and runtime memory management. So first, let's take a look at the front-end part. We will take TensorFlow front-end as an example because it's especially complicated. So for a static neural network model, we can treat it as a directed acyclic graph, which has no circle. And we, we can straightforward parse every node one by one uh, following the topological ordering. However, for a dynamic neural network model with control flow, especially with loop, the condition doesn't stand anymore. And the while loop will create circle for our graph. And we cannot match these nodes one by one for, with topological ordering, which will lead us to an infinite loop. This is how we handle this problem by pattern matching the whole loop blocks into a relay recursive function. So there are three major parts. The first is alter node visiting order. So we need uh, to visit the control flow nodes first to ensure all of them are converted appropriately first. As the second part is the loop invariant code motion. We need to identify the scope of every loop and move the invariant code out of the scope to make sure that there is no duplicated computation in our graph. The third part is the backtrack node construction. Uh, we Right now, it's possible that we need to start from an intermediate node of the graph. And obviously, we need to backtrack all the ancestor nodes until we find that all the nodes are converted. And then we can go back to the current node to complete the conversion. This is the major work for the front-end uh, loop handling. The next part is for the front-end is the tensor array optimization. Tensor array is a widely used data structure in these dynamic models. And basically it's a list of tensors. Theoretically, the tensor in a tensor array can have arbitrarily data type, uh, data shape, and even dynamic tensor rank. However, the dynamic tensor rank is very rare in deep learning models. So this makes uh, opportunity for us to further optimization. So previously, we only bind the data type to a tensor array, which means the input and output tensor has arbitrarily or no shape for a tensor array. And it's not very good for our optimization. And right now, we implement a new primitive to bind 
the tensor shape to our tensor array, which makes the input and output tensors has the specific shape bind to them. And this helps us to make the whole graph more static and friendly for optimization. These are the two major parts for the front-end enhancement to support dynamic models. And next, I'll take a non-maximum suppression as an example to see how do we support such a complicated dynamic operators in Relay and Topi. So non-maximum suppression has uh, the number of bounding boxes as a variable. And to compute the number of bounding boxes, it's almost redo the whole computation of NMS and it's not feasible. This is how we manage uh, the memory allocation for this operator. So at the beginning, we keep all the valid boxes and indices and we sort them in descending order of the score to make sure all the lowering lower scoring boxes are at the end of the box tensor. And at the end of the NMS computation, we have already get the actual number of bounding boxes. At this point, we can remove or prune the unselected boxes with the operation strided slice. This is how we handle the, fur the dynamic operator part of our work. So, in the next, Hai-Chen will present the backend runtime system to support dynamic models. Okay, next I will describe how TVM supports the dynamic object detection models. So in fact, last year, Jared and I presented the Nimble project that adds the support for compilation and execution of the dynamic models. Here, I will just give you a quick overview uh, of it. And for more details, you can check out the last year's presentation. So as previously described by Yao, uh, we can now convert the model, the object detection model from TensorFlow to Relay. So next, we enhance the TVM compiler to by adding a dynamic type system support, a shape function that computes the, uh, that computes the output shape at the runtime, uh, and add a, a set of uh, optimization passes, including the memory planning and device placement that are aware of dynamic shapes and control flows. And last, we also enhance the symbolic generation to uh, improve the performance. So next, the compiler will output two objects. One is the VM object and the other is the kernel library. The VM ob object is hardware independent. It has two segments. The code segment uh, contains the VM bytecode and is uh, hardware independent. Uh, this VM bytecodes predicate how the model executes, and the data segment contains all the pre-trained weights and the constants. Uh, the kernel library is hardware dependent and, and is highly optimized for the specific hardware. And later, these two objects will be loaded into the uh, lightweight uh, virtual machine, the, which is the runtime, so I interpret these interactions and execute the models, invoke the kernels. Uh, just to give a little bit more details about uh, the, this project, we introduced the any dimension that represents an unknown dimension at a compilation time. So after we having the any, we can now define the tensor with the shape uh, as like any by three by 32 by 32, where the batch dimension is unknown. And we can also define the type relation function for those data dependent operator like a range, that uh, this type relation function takes the start, stop, and step and output uh, to a 1D tensor with the any dimension. Accordingly, we also need to update the type system to be able to infer the types with any uh, dimension present. And however, uh, the type system cannot rule out all the type errors because we cannot determine uh, the value for the any dimension. So that we add the, uh, the shape function, uh, which is a lightweight uh, way to compute the output shape at the runtime and also perform actual type checking at the runtime to make sure the program will execute uh, correctly. And the type, the shape function is actually defining in TRR and is embedded into the, uh, the data flow program so that it can, we can apply the same optimization to the both shape function and the operator kernels. And also, as I mentioned before, like we also added up a bunch of optimizing passes that are aware of dynamic features and last, we designed and implemented a tensor-oriented virtual machine uh, runtime 
that can efficiently execute, uh, interpret these bytecodes and execute a compiled model. So next, I will talk about like a new thing, which is called the operator strategy. Uh, so this is focused on how to, an operator defining relay is lower to your kernel implementation. So now we are having like more and more kernel imp implementations in the TVM and also as, as well as the third party library. So the operator strategy provides a mechanism or an interface that allows the developer to program the kernel implementation selection process. And it can also help the, the compiler to select the best kernel implementation, uh, whichever possible. So take the COM2D uh, operator as an example. So in the first step, it will based on the target you compile to, uh, it will invoke the corresponding uh, shape, uh, strategy function. So in this case, if we consider like this a CUDA as our target, so we invoke the CUDA strategy function. And further, based on the operator attributes, for example, uh, if the operator has the NC, the COM2D has the NCHW layout, it will include the NCHW topi implementation. And if the kernel size is no more than uh, seven, then it will also include the Winograd topi kernel implementation. Uh, and third, if the QDN library is enabled in the target, it will also uh, include the, uh, the QDN implementation uh, kernel implementation in the strategy. Um, and then after that, it will then query the auto TVM log if there's possible, uh, if it exists. So, and then check out like what's the latency for each implementation and then use the one that gives the la lowest latency uh, to compile uh, as this kernel. So last, like, let, uh, let's look at the evaluation results of the object det detection models um, on, the, uh, on the instance. So we evaluate the object detection model on the EC2 M6G 8X large instance. So this is an ARM-based uh, instance that has 32 ARM cores. So we use the Docker image provided by ARM that come with the TensorFlow and PyTorch uh, pre-installed. Pre uh, and we also use the TVM to compile the models from TensorFlow and PyTorch and then optimize that and compare the performance to the native uh, frameworks. So we can see that TVM is slightly faster than the TensorFlow on the SSD mobile net model. And then it can also 1.4x uh, faster uh, than, uh, for the faster RCN ResNet 50 model than the TensorFlow. The PyTorch uh, model, because the version in this Docker container is too, too low, so it cannot execute the faster RCN ResNet model. However, the TVM can still compile and run that. Uh, but due to like there's too many dynamic uh, shaped uh, uh, op uh, operators in the faster RCN from the PyTorch, so the latency is slightly uh, is higher than the, what we get from the TensorFlow. So we're continuing working on to improve the performance of the PyTorch uh, uh, for, to support the PyTorch models. So next, we is going to talk about the integrating frameworks with TVM to make the model run faster. Hi, everybody. My name is Wei. I'm going to talk about a work that we did in 2020 the work is TVM and Machine Learning Framework Integration. My name is Wei Xiao. I work for the AWS AI organization. So the problem we're trying to solve is how do we optimize models using a compiler like TVM? A lot of models cannot be supported by TVM because the number of operators in TVM front-end converter is a lot less than the number of operators in the framework. For example, in the table I have here, MXNet, the front end supports 228 operators, but the framework supports 1,044 operators. These numbers we obtained on October 2020. The numbers are increasing all the time. So how do we solve this problem? If we try to add support for each operator, it's going to take a long time. So the solution we came up with was to do a partial compile for a model. So I'm going to use an example here. This is the alpha post model from the Gluon CV model zoo. In this model, we figured out that we can have these subgraphs from 0 to 4. These are the blue circles in the picture that are completely supported by TVM. And then we have these orange circles, which are operators not supported by TVM. So by having a 
runtime that is a combination of the framework runtime and the TVM runtime, we're able to do inference on such models. And this work has been released in the Amazon SageMaker Neo compiler service, as well as the SageMaker hosting service. So in this slide, I will show you a little bit more details about the compiled, partially compiled model. So with this simple cat and a grab command, you are able to see this JSON file. At the bottom, you'll see that there are five of these operators, which are called TVM subgraph op. These are the blue circles you see in the previous slide. And then you see these four operators. They are broadcast-like, and they are not ones not supported by TVM. And then you have these other operators, which are indented and that's the operators in the subgraph. So now I'm gonna show you the speed up of the partially compiled model. So there is, the speed up is defined as long compiled divide compiled model latency. So here you'll see that we have an instance, a CPU instance, EC2 instance, C5, 9XL. And for this alpha post model, it has a speed up of 1.28. And on the GPU instance, it has a speed up of 1.23. Now I'm going to show you a few more models in the TensorFlow and PyTorch framework, as well as the MXNet framework. So we have ResNet model here, Inception and YOLO. And we have these different numbers of speed ups, and we have CPU and GPU instances. So now I'm going to talk about a few learnings we have after this project. So one of the biggest problem facing us was that we have to determine the number of subgraphs and the boundaries of these subgraphs. That is gonna have a big impact on the performance of the partially compiled model. We also must deal with various operator related restrictions such as data types. The second thing I want to mention is that we have to figure out how to allocate threads properly between the framework and the TVM runtime. When things are not properly allocated, we see lots of context switches and bad performance. We also figure out a way to do zero data copy to the subgraph to reduce the overhead. I also want to mention one more thing that is we take advantage of the work where we can integrate TensorRT and TVM together. This is useful because we discovered on certain GPU instances, the TVM performance is not as good as TensorRT performance. Finally, I want to share a few things with the community. One thing we're working on is we're always working on supporting more models. So we're working on a project to have the new front end to TensorFlow 2.x, as well as taking advantage of the MLIR project, which means more operators can be supported in TVM more easily. We're always adding data types and more operators to all the existing framework front end converters as well. By taking both of these approaches, we can have a good range of models supported. The second thing I want to mention is that we wish that the Relay VM compile time can be reduced. Right now, it's substantially more than the graph runtime compile time. And the third thing I want to mention is that we're also working on improving runtime performance. So the Relay VM performance on GPU in particular is not very good right now. Uh, the other, another thing we want to work on is to remove the extra memory copy for the output tensor when the TVM runtime is used. That's all. This is the end of my talk. Thank you.
And uh, given that there are none right now, I maybe just wanted to ask one question uh, so we can uh, part off with some uh, thoughts about the future of TVM. Uh, but we've, we've been given a lot of very exciting examples of uses of TVM by several companies to support special purpose hardware, right? Beyond going beyond CPUs and GPUs. Uh, and we've already seen examples in past conferences of hardware being supported, and this is only growing. Uh, what are some of the features that um, some of you are most excited about in the next year? Uh, or what are the things that you'd love to see and start a discussion on? Uh, anyone willing to take that question? So this is Ida from AWS. Maybe I can speak a bit about that. So the interesting little report was uh, the, the video was recorded before our event, but after that, you know, that AWS announced a new hardware called AWS Training. So it's a special purpose hardware for large scale training. And we are actually working on the compilation chain of it. And, um, you know, as like AWS in French, yeah, we will continue utilize the uh, whatever feature that TBM will provide. We would definitely reuse um, the things instead of reinventing them. And then, you know, it's a special purpose uh, accelerator. There are a lot of interesting uh, challenges inside. That's something that we are interested in working on. And, you know, we would keep updates to the community and, you know, to find support and maybe also find collaborations whenever it's possible. Okay. And the other thing I think, you know, in terms of the new hardware, I, was things that I would like to point out is like, I think um, many speakers already mentioned is about um, the tensorization. So broadly speaking, is to try to utilize uh, those customized compute units um, in an efficient way. So in general, we call it tensorization, right? So whether it's, it's this historical array or just like the tensor core of uh, NVIDIA GPU, these kind of things, that would be interested for the entire community to think about a generic way to utilize those spatial purpose compute units. Yep, that's it, thanks. Great, thank you very much, Ida. And, and, and I think the rest of the community is extremely excited about you know, further developments on training, further developments on, on supporting tensorization in the next year. And I'm sure that, that in the next conference, you'll hear a lot more about some, some early achievements in, those, uh, in both fronts. Uh, I'll take